Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, my name is Bethany Het Gauthier, and I'm going to do a few housekeeping items before we hand it over to Michelle Berry for our official welcome. I want to go over just a few housekeeping rules or housekeeping items before we launch into today's session. Um, as a reminder, the full session details, including the agenda and bios, can be found at the website. I'll put that link in the chat, but our goal is to keep the introductions um, brief so that we can focus on the content, but you can find more about the future participants on that link. Videos are optional, but encouraged, particularly if you're talking or asking a question, um, if you can find a way to come on online. We do ask that you stay muted unless you are speaking. Um, if you're experiencing any technical issues, reach out to Eve Estrada. So you can either chat Eve through the chat or you can email her. She's keeping an eye on email. Um, unfortunately, one of the events yesterday had a Zoom hacker. So in the event of a Zoom hacker, we'll just shut down this window and I'll email out a new link to everyone. So check your emails if in, in that case. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, you can submit that via the chat function. Um, and during the open discussion, feel free to raise your hand. If you want to remain anonymous, you can email your questions to or um, chat your questions to me or Eve. And then finally, um, we'll have points of discussion throughout, but I just want to seed some of the questions that we will be asking you as we move to the discussion sections. Um, so things that we'd love for you to be thinking about as we go through the participate through the different um, speakers. What are your university's facilitators or barriers to equitable partnership or impactful research? If you can make one administrative or policy change at your university with the goal of equity and impact, what would it be? What strategies can you adopt to advocate for these changes at your university? And how can a broader community, including CUGH, support for ad your advocating for change? So with that, I am pleased to hand this over to Michelle Berry, who will do the official welcome to today's event. Thank you. Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this satellite session on the critical need to transform university policies to encourage equity in global health research. Collaborative global health research is an important approach for better understanding issues leading to poor health outcomes in low resource countries and for identifying strategies to address these issues cooperatively. In global health research, power imbalances between researchers and between research institutions caused by colonialism, historical injustices, geopolitical interests, economic oppression, and persistent structural racism have resulted in poor research practices and collaboration. These include a failure of researchers from high resource settings to equitably engage collaborators with fewer resources and less power. Moreover, <clears throat> high resource institutions have created huge administrative burdens and promotional criteria for global health researchers that do not take into consideration barriers often encountered in overseas work. In 2021, CUGH established a working group of LMIC, HIC, and indigenous voices to address the issue of decolonizing global health. Academic institutions in high income countries have benefited the most from power imbalances and have the greatest need to change. As this working group noted in the Annals of Global Health publication on decolonizing global health, the HIC institution or funding agency often sets the research agenda, formulates the research questions, designs the studies, and is the primary receiver of money with most of the indirect money going to their institution. Often the fundings are presented at conferences and in English language journals that may be unavailable or and or unaffordable to their partner in the LMIC where their study was conducted. These practices are perpetuated through promotional incentives that favor first and senior authorship, along with favoring funding that benefit the HIC investigator rather than partner institutions. NIH Fogarty has attempted to rectify where the primary funding goes by creating partnerships such as the MEPI twinning programs. For Zimbabwe, for instance, my twin site received primary received primary ownership of the money. This was a real first for NIH. However, 
The indirect money to support the program was about one seventh of what Stanford would have received. We need to be clear eyed about when imperialistic structures may inadvertently color our work and relationships so that we can intentionally dismantle them. We must do so not only in the name of fairness, but to ensure better patient outcomes. In order to dismantle these inequities and disparities in global health research, we need both individual and systemic action. The intent and design of research programs, for instance, is critical. We should aspire to a spirit of equal exchange and mutual benefit. To facilitate this, institutions can and must make changes to the incentives they provide faculty. Ultimately, we hope CUGH will introduce the first policy guidelines in the consortium's history focused on university level changes to academic promotion criteria and administrative constraints. We are a consortium of universities. Such changes we hope can improve equity in collaboration and generate more impactful global research that ultimately improves patient outcomes. Such a statement will aid, add weight to individual advocacy that has already been occurring by many of the people on this um, webinar. CUGH can be a leader living its vision of quote, supporting the university as a transforming force in global health. During this session, we will explore strategies, best practices to promote equity in global health research, challenges and barriers to achieving this goal, and most importantly, how we can create and work together for meaningful change by developing equitable and very pragmatic guidelines. I really hope that this, this session comes out um, with wonderful guidelines for the consortium to promote. I will now hand it over to Miriam Chuckman from the University of Toronto, who will give the background on how the first draft recommendations were reached. Miriam, over to you. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, with my slides. So thank you very much. Okay. So um, this first slide is just a review of the housekeeping items. Um, I don't know uh, if, if there are people who entered since the beginning, uh, Bethany walked through this earlier, but just so people are aware, I'll just leave that up for a minute so you can read that. Okay, um, so, my talk is um, about how we got to this point. Um, like Michelle, I'm hopeful and uh, I'm gonna tell you how we got here, a group of us uh, working on this and trying to get to the point of CUGH, urging universities to make changes. Um, and I, I'm starting this in 2014. And the reason I'm starting in 2014 is that um, in that year, there was a meeting in Cape Town and three of us were at a panel discussion. Jimmy Volmink, who's here today and will talk today, uh, was talking about unfair collaborations that he was aware of. Um, I was moderating and, and talking about uh, cases that I was aware of. And Bethany Hedgothier, who is so uh, instrumental to this session this morning, uh, was in the audience and came up afterwards to talk about cases she was aware of. Um, and a group of us, the, the, the group began to grow, um, was very interested in why there were these cases of unfair collaborations between high income country partners and low and middle income country partners. We went on to do an analysis that used bibliometric evidence and I'll spend a minute or two on that this morning. Um, and we got to the point of thinking about the structures that favored unfair collaborations. And as Michelle alluded to, there are structures at journals, there are structures at funders that have begun to change and structures at institutions and universities, and that's been our focus. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna start with a case, and this is a case from October of 2014. Um, 
This was a study uh, that was an important study. Um, tuberculosis, as you know, is a major killer in low and middle income countries. And this was a clinical trial to see if you could change a six month regimen to a three or four month regimen of medication, and that would make a difference. Um, it was a study that took about eight years. It cost about $58 million. Um, there were about 2,700, more than 2,700 participants, and half of them were in South Africa. Others were in Zambia, Kenya. Um, there were uh, participants in Asia, China, uh, Pakistan, Malaysia, and also Mexico. Um, and I'm showing you this because every single author you see on your screen there is from either the UK or the US. How did something like this happen? Well, that's exactly what uh, these people who ran, Dr. Chanda and Dr. Laki, who ran the trial in Zambia, saw this and they had no idea this was coming out in the, in the New England. Neither did any of the researchers that I spoke to in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and were shocked You know what, what happened. And as Dr. Chanda said to me, he said, I was like, okay, did I miss an email here? Or what happened? So he goes over to Dr. Laki and says, okay, Shabir, exactly what happened. Um, the person who probably knows the most about how you could do such a study and then none of the people who were involved in actually running the trial on the ground or doing the lab work for a TB study were authors of the paper is this man, Dr. Tom Niarenda, who was then and is still now with the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, which was the funder, one of the funders of the study. And they looked into this and he said to me, there was just a committee within that was drafting the papers. And at that point, you can say that they forgot to copy the Africans. So many of you know of cases like this, and um, we will talk about what we can do to make that stop. Um, I'm gonna move on now to other evidence of uh, inequitable collaborations, not from cases that we, anecdotal cases that we happen to see, uh, but from bibliometric research where authorship is considered as a proxy for equity in a collaboration. And um, this group of us, Bethany, uh, Jimmy Volmink, and several other people who are here today, um, began to work on a bibliometric uh, study using a database uh, from 2014 to 2016. And um, what we were looking at were papers in an individual country in Sub-Saharan Africa, where um, it was health research about that country. And we wondered for the low and middle income country researchers in that country, um, where did they wind up on the author list? And we also wondered, did it matter who they collaborated with? Did that have any effect on where they wound up on the author list? And as you can see from the title of our paper, we found out that they were usually stuck in the middle of the author list. And as many of you know, the prestigious authorships, whether you're in a high income or a low income country, are the first author and the last author. And when you go to apply for grants or you go, to, you go up for promotion, um, people are really interested in whether you first authored or last authored a paper. And if you're in the middle, it doesn't matter that much. So uh, that's where we, we did find that over 50% of the papers had authors from the country where the research took place, but they were usually stuck in the middle. Um, the major take home message for us was that it did matter who you collaborated with. If you collaborated with, um, if you're in Zambia, say, and you're collaborating with someone from the USA, Canada, or Europe, you have less of a chance of uh, being represented as a first or senior author. And the lowest chance is if you collaborated with someone in the US who's at a top 20 US university. Um, and that was quite striking to us. We looked at the list of top 20 US graduate schools of public health. And if you were collaborating with someone from that university, you had the least chance of being an author and or of being a first or senior author on that paper. That led us to thinking about the structural factors at universities that drive what some people have termed authorship hoarding that drive the professors at the high income countries to make sure they are the first authors or they are the senior authors leaving their low and middle income country partners in the middle. Um, and so Megan Murray at Harvard Medical School and Bethany at Gautier, 
convened a meeting of a group of us uh, to discuss this, what was going on between equitable collaborations and academic promotions. And that led to this uh, comment in The Lancet, where we basically were criticizing what was happening at universities and um, the policies they had for promotions that failed to consider um, the low and middle income country partners. And so these were the sorts of criticisms we published in The Lancet, um, for example, that promotions committees were not looking at academics uh, at authorship that reflected real collaboration. Instead, they were evaluating academics by the number of publications they had and their place in authorship order. And we urged that they begin to value the high income country researchers contribution when the low and middle income country uh, collaborator was the first or senior author. Um, that comment led to uh, Michelle actually uh, inviting Bethany and the rest of us to consider doing a panel in 2019 at CUGH, which we did. There was a very active discussion around these issues, and we were all excited that something could come from this and maybe even that CUGH could be involved in advocating for the sorts of changes that would need to happen uh, to prevent universities from contributing and incentivizing the power imbalances um, that took place in these um, unfair partnerships, unfair collaborations. Um, and then, of course, you all know that what happened was the pandemic. So just about just over a year ago, um, Bethany really called all of us back together again and said, we can't let this issue drop. We've got to move forward on this. Um, and fast forward to 2023. And um, Bethany actually presented to the board uh, at CUGH saying we really would like uh, CUGH to take action here. Michelle has been uh, very involved in that as well. And we're very hopeful now. Um, and what we're asking for uh, is for CUGH to endorse a position statement. Uh, and there's a draft of such a statement uh, on the website um, that would recommend universities change their promotions policies so that they are discouraging unfair collaborations instead of incentivizing them. And I am hopeful, and one of the reasons I'm hopeful that universities can begin to change is that in the years since we've been working on this, especially in the last two to three years, there have been substantial changes at journals. So if you think of journals and funders and universities as the main drivers here, journals there are now increasing numbers of journals that decline to review papers that have data from low and middle income countries if there's no author from that country. And there have been editorials in journals saying that they disapprove of such papers. And there are journals that require authors to talk about how their collaboration promotes equity. So for all of those reasons, I am hopeful and um, looking forward to the rest of this discussion today. Thank you. And I'm now going to welcome uh, Catherine Chu, uh, the director of the Center for Global Surgery at Stellenbosch University, um, who is going to moderate the next session. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhushman and Dr. Barry, for setting the scene for today's satellite session. I think you guys have brought up such important points um, about the interactions in collaborations between high income and low and middle income. Um, investigators. And I think that the, the main thing that you pointed out, the main issue is that it's a structural problem. I think in global health, we cannot rely on the goodwill of each individual investigator to quote unquote, do the right thing um, from high income countries when interacting with low and middle income country investigators. And, you know, we want things to be equitable, but everybody comes with different skills and a different starting point in their research and different amounts of time that they can contribute. And I think without some structural changes, um, it would be difficult for individuals one by one to really go against the system, because in the end, we all do need to um, make salaries and survive in our own academic system. So that's a wonderful start. Um, I was asked by Bethany to direct people to the chat. There is a Mentimeter survey about identifying the um, participants as to where you're from, and that would be really useful and interesting for us. And so um, for those of you who haven't seen in the chat the Mentimeter link, um, it takes just a second to click on that. Uh, and now without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, um, Dr. Rashi Junjunwala, who is going to um, talk first about a survey that she's done. Um, Rashi, the floor is yours. 
Hi, uh, thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Chu, for intro the introduction. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about just a couple things. I think in the concept of um, work we've done uh, in understanding uh, barriers to global health equity, um, there's been quite a few things that we focused on. Uh, a survey that Prof. Chu is uh, referring to is a survey we've done regarding um, the, the the access and barriers to developing surgical health policy uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and the SADC region specifically. And I think it leads in, I'm, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the survey and its its results now because uh, it's not, that's not the focus of what uh, I'm hoping to talk to you here, but I wanted to talk more about um, how I got to be involved in that project and then how that has implications for me as a surgical trainee from the United States. So uh, I've, I've been uh, working with, I'm a, I'm a surgical trainee from the United States, as I mentioned, and I'm from the United States originally, and I have had an interest in global health since prior to medical school. It's one of the reasons I chose to go to medical school uh, because I was interested in healthcare for people who had uh, the least access. And I think my views on that have stayed somewhat true and somewhat evolved um, in the last decade and a bit. Um, but I think one of the things that has been really positive is it, it led me to participate in the program in global surgery and social change as a research fellow, which is where I met um, Bethany and also Prof Chu, uh, Dr. Hedgothier and, and Dr. Chu. So um, I was involved with this research project, the survey uh, as a request and also a uh, as a component of my research fellowship in which I developed this survey in partnership with a uh, research fellow from the University of Witzwaterstrand in South Africa. And uh, we've also worked together to deliver it and also present it together. Um, one of the things that I think this uh, draft proposal and the uh, the proposal for the changes in recognizing academic equity and the path to academic equity, academic equity and how that is relevant to my work is that, um, you know, I'm still a trainee and I am hoping to um, work with, uh, with uh, you know, people in the global health space uh, throughout the rest of my career. But I work also within a very restrictive system that focuses on uh, publications and other, you know, very narrow uh, examples of academic success, and that doesn't really sit well with me as a in an individual and a researcher, and also I don't think is uh, consistent with equity and moral justice in in the global health space in, at large. So I'm I'm stuck in this tension um, in how to achieve academic success for myself, but also stay true to my principles and the principles of, uh, you know, everything that has been has been said already coming, uh, coming into a, a place where I am not the person who is uh, the most experienced or has the context, but then also having this tension of my, my work and my efforts not being recognized because I wouldn't be the first or senior author on the manuscripts that are developed as a result of this work. So uh, promotion in my experience and in my, uh, my context as a academic trainee and a person who is hoping to proceed in academic circles in, in general in surgery um, is that uh, you know the specialties in the United States, particular since that is what I can speak to, are still um, skewed. Promotion is still skewed in the way of only researching, uh, recognizing research in a very narrow scope. Um, and there's this idea, even in some specialties, that you aren't taking your job or your career seriously if you don't do basic science research, for example. Uh, global surgery and global health is almost the opposite of basic science work in that uh, it doesn't require a lab, it requires partnerships. And um, the funding is not available. I applied for four surgical trainee grants uh, to fund my uh, academic development time, and I received only one of those. Uh, and, you know, so these challenges, I think, persist in the way that uh, it 
it, I, the work that I want to do, the work that speaks to me and I think is the most um, relevant to my interests and my passions, but I also want to do so in an equitable way that also, you know, maintains my chances for personal academic success as I move forward. So I think the draft proposal um, that we are discussing here today uh, is something that is really important to me in the value that should be given to um, reviewing candidates, uh, you know, other types of academic, uh, academic achievements, such as mentorship, collaboration, uh, helping achieve funding uh, for not just for myself, but for other people working in the same space, um, uh, getting other types of uh, efforts, such as advocacy and non-academic peer-reviewed publications, uh, to reach a wider audience, uh, those sorts of things, I think being recognized would also widen the scope of who and how we can promote different types of viewpoints uh, in the in the academic world and specifically for my context, academic surgery. So I think those are the main points that I wanted to mention. And I um, am happy to, you know, if there's anything that people are curious about or want to ask questions in the chat, I'm really happy to uh, to answer those or reflect on any of them. And Prof. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jun Junwala. And I think it's fantastic that you're sharing firsthand some of the challenges of navigating a career, an early career in academics, specifically in global surgery, um, working in a high-income country in the US, but trying to work and be true to some of the ethics that you know that you want to. Um, I just it, it just also struck me, I was just uh, moderating a panel for AFRI Health yesterday. And afterwards, I got a message from a young um, doctor trainee, more or less in your space, an anesthetist um, from Namibia, who's expressing her frustration that you know, for their promotions, they also need publications. And she has been involved in collaborative research with those from high income countries, um, but she doesn't know how to write the papers and nobody is teaching her how. And so isn't it for a lack of not wanting to, and I think she was given the opportunity, but because the time frame pressures are quick in grants and outputs and projects, you know, if the low and middle income country person is given the opportunity and doesn't produce it within a few weeks, then it's taken away and given to their counterpart in the US, who frankly can write faster and quicker and has more experience. And so I think we also need to recognize those. And, and you know, in this whole discussion, are there mechanisms that can be built in for capacity building? Because I think we give a lot of lip service to capacity building, but how does that actually work? You know, people like Dr. Het Gauthier spent hours, countless hours of their time in Rwanda teaching research methodology, but I don't know where on that CV that gets her the promotion. So we can talk about that more later. Um, I'll move on to our next speaker who rarely, barely needs any introduction in the global health field. It's Dr. Abin Bola from the University of Sydney. Um, we have a, a pre-recorded video from him on reflexivity in the promotions process. Um, so Eve, if you could play that for us. Hello, my name is Bethany Het Gauthier and I'm here with Shea Edmumbola, Associate Professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Sydney who's going to share with us some thoughts on the role of reflexivity in academic promotion processes. Dr. Abambola, thank you for being with us here today. And I wonder if you can just start off by sharing some high level thoughts about the role of universities in promoting collaborative equity. Thank you very much for having me. Um, when I think about universities, I think first about students. And when I think about the kind of change we want to see in global health, I think that it's still in the future in some way, which means that the students we are training today um, are the ones who will likely bring that reality into being. Now, the challenge uh, for doing that is that the university as it is continues to model for the students the current realities. In other words, it's hard for students to imagine an alternative reality in the system within which they are being trained and the people to whom they look up to, um, I, I particularly, way, which makes it difficult in many ways. And, and you know, whenever I'm really sad about the potential for real change to happen, I'm sad precisely because of the kinds of people students 
are constrained <laughs> to look up to because they in many instances are themselves being sh- have themselves been shaped by the culture of the university the culture of the field in which they work such that there is a perpetuating loop somewhere there that needs to be broken uh, and it's um, we often focus on people who are sort of affected by a reality to sort of ask them to change things <laughs> but very often things need to be changed at a higher level and so I believe that universities, systems of incentives, systems of hierarchy and privilege and preference um, um, need to be altered if the academics who work within there are going to have the free space to do what is right. Which also for me flows further to the students who study there, being able to find themselves in a position that they are looking up to people who are doing the right things, or at least modeling the right things for them so that they can actually bring about the change that we need to see in the field. Thank you for that. And can you tell us a little bit more about what reflexivity is and why it's important for global health equity? Now, in, in global health, we, um, we, we, we do global health from a position of privilege. Um, it is, by its very definition, um, a practice that involves intervening, working on behalf of people who are less privileged that, than the person intervening is or, or the people are, which means that we come to the work that we do with a certain degree of um, ignorance about the realities of the people we are working with. And for me, reflexivity basically means critical self-reflection, which is that you are able to deeply think about, introspect in relation to your position. So you know exactly what it is um, you're doing uh, and and in what ways that thing you're doing may be suboptimal because of your position. And then to work hard after having realized that um, to make sure that you create the conditions you do your work in ways that limit the potential of your position to undermine in many ways what it is you're trying to do. So, so that for me is, is, is what reflexivity is and that's its critical self-reflection in that way. Um, now, I, I know that we have seen what I've just said um, is that as people who are working at a distance, at a remove, because of power and privilege, but also because of many other things, including just geography. Um, sometimes we, we are working from a high income country and, and the people we are working with are in a lower middle income country. There's geographical distance. Um, there's also well, various forms of social distance, which could exist within a particular space or across spaces. Um, you know, it could be language, it could be culture, it could be religion, it could be income, it could be many, many other things. Now, th- those circumstances then mean um, that there's only a slice of the reality of the people we're working with that we can truly, fully appreciate. Um, and, and I like very much the, um, the very ancient metaphor of, of the elephant and the six blind or blindfolded people. Uh, and I'd like to think very often that, that we are just one of those six. Very often, there are five other positions that we are not at. Um, and the people who are within that system, within that reality, are those five other positions. And, and if you know, if they could talk among themselves, they would figure out what our position is. In other words, we, we are much, you know, very, you know, much less consequential than they are to understanding their social um, realities. Uh, which means again that, that understanding that um, uh, that that distance uh, and that knowledge gap and what it means for our ignorance um, is for me a very central element of being reflexive. Thanks. And do you have some thoughts about how we could incorporate reflexivity into the promotion process and what impact that could have on collaborative practice? So academia is extremely competitive. Even in situations in which the system hasn't asked us to compete, we compete. (laughs) It just it goes to show just how much um, it's been sort of woven into the fabrics of our brains and minds that we are here to run a race. And what that does to us is that we optimize excessively for the things that can be counted, for the things that can count toward um, a sense that we are winning. And very often the things that count towards the sense that we're winning are the, the publications we, we get, the positions we have on those publications as authors, 
um, it's the grants we get, um, it's the positions we are on those grants that we get, it's the amount of funds that we can bring to our institutions, um, it's the places and journals in which we publish. There are all these markers of success that have been designed by the system in which we work and that the university system itself exemplifies and promotes and, and emphasizes. And so if you have a global health researcher who wants to be collaborative, um, who wants to share resources, who wants to share power and privilege, who wants to do all of these things that um, I've just reflected on that being, being critical itself reflective um, compels us to do, um, that person, by virtue of doing the right thing, will not be competitive in the space in which they work, which is the university space. And that goes back to my initial point, that then what happens is that the people who are teaching students who will run things in five, ten years, are modeling a practice in which they are constrained by virtue of the incentive structure within which they work to not share power and privilege, to not support people, who do not spend their time doing things that do not contribute to those things that count in terms of competition and success. So there is a default, as it were, that, that if, even those who want to do the right things, even if even those who know that they are doing the wrong, wrong things by, by obeying the dictates of the system, can hardly do otherwise very often because of the structures within which they operate. They have to, after all, they, they want to be successful. After all, they've been working all their lives to reach a certain position. After all, um, they have families to feed. All of these other factors are, are playing people's lives, such that, it, to my mind, the, the most important critical entity that could begin to restructure those incentive systems are universities. If they were to say, for example, that we will give you XYZ points for being collaborative, we'll give you XYZ points for mentoring and sharing power, we'll give you XYZ points for, you know, supporting people to do a BC, we'll give you XYZ points for channeling resources to institutions and locations that are much less resourced than perhaps the ones where we are based as academics. If, if the system says we will do all of that explicitly, then by virtue of that, we are beginning to bring into reality, in fact, that future that we aim, that global health will, will aim towards. Which also that means that teachers, professors, academics, mentors are able to model those practices for their students, which means that the students are more likely then to bring into reality that different um, global health. Thank you again, Dr. Edmund Bola, for being with us today. We appreciate you sharing your thoughts. Wow, such wise words um, from Dr. Edmund Bola, as always. I mean, I just have to reflect on a few of the things he said, um, that we do global health from a position of privilege. And I think that is, is quite important to remember. I think we all consider ourselves do-gooders, but I think, you know, we are working from a position of privilege and a, and a position of distance often. And, you know, his whole definition of reflexivity is critical self-reflection and trying to see other people's points of view, uh, I, I think is a really great one. Um, now for the next 40 minutes, we're going to try and lean into this topic and conversation, try to stay away from the distance. Um, we have a fantastic panel. Um, all chosen because of their experience working in different types of global health collaborations. And I hope that each of them can share a bit more um, about their experiences and specifically about how it relates um, into their own academic careers. Um, I'm just gonna introduce everybody by name, but I'm hoping that each of them will spend two or three minutes talking a little bit about themselves. Uh, but we'll go in the order in which I'm gonna introduce them. The first is Dr. Marvin Gonzalez. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the University College London. Um, originally from Guatemala. Dr. Manasi Kumar, psychiatrist from Aga Khan University in Nairobi. Dr. Wendy Pultom O'Mara, um, an implementation scientist from Duke University in the US. And hopefully we'll also have Dr. Gina Teddy, um, a health systems specialist from um, the University of Ghana join us as well. Um, so if we could start with Dr. Gonzalez, um, if you could just tell us a little bit about your 
global health collaborations in Korea, um, and then maybe touch upon some of the points um, that we've already been discussing. And then after that, um, we will have Dr. M um, Kumar go. Uh, good morning to everyone, and, and thank you, Professor Shu and Dr. Uh, Teddy and Omara and Kumar. Uh, I'm, Mar I'm Marvin Gonzalez from Nicaragua, and I've been working in uh, original from Nicaragua. I've been working in Nicaragua for 15 years. I decided to move to the UK in the last uh, year because I'm doing my postdoctoral uh, fellow uh, there. Um, I've been working at public uh, university teaching at the medical school and conducting a uh, research in, in, the, in my country, in Nicaragua. Uh, I am a medical doctor with a clinical training and also with a training on research in the UK. And being, uh, I had a lot of expertise developing collaborate, uh, local and international collaboration related to a research project and also uh, developing local capacity on hearing loss and also uh, coordinating some donation for uh, improving the uh, healthcare access to patients with uh, suffering from chronic kidney disease in the country. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kumar, could you also tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you can how you use your academic role to drive issues around health equity and impact, specifically in your global health collaboration? No, thank you, uh, Dr. Chu and uh, my fellow panelists. Um, um, uh, my name is uh, Manasi Kumar, and I'm um, also affiliated with University of Nairobi Department of uh, psychiatry, and I'm a clinical psychologist, not a psychiatrist, but uh, I, I teach in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, I, I, I think I uh, mainly have been troubled by um, the challenges around um, how do uh, LMIC institutions support um, researchers uh, in kind of forging um, uh, and carving uh, global health, health as a field, mental health, uh, as it pertains to me, uh, in ways that uh, will promote more equitable, dynamic, innovative partnerships. So there, there, there has been a continuous struggle because um, one understands the challenges that uh, uh, that are uh, around these institutions, but also uh, that one feels caged within that institutional context, and one knows that. Um, Partly the reason why uh, the institutions are limiting is also because of the global discourse, because of how uh, the institutions are also uh, manipulated by popular trends and patterns and uh, conditions of engagement. Um, and so the position that I'm um, now increasingly leaning towards is to create a bifocal awareness, that is to uh, to work with my colleagues, to work with my students, to work with uh, my collaborators uh, at an individual level to start challenging practices, to start developing alternative ways. I think what is important in addition to challenging uh, these practices is to show alternative ways in which one can do better, uh, more promising, more equitable uh, kinds of research, partnerships, have better vision, broader vision, holistic vision, uh, vision that is in tune to lives of people that we intend to serve, and at the same time, create confidence within institutions uh, where we belong uh, to say that um, unless you feel good about what you do and your what, what where you are, um, and that you feel good about us as individuals who are contributing to the scholarship, um, you won't have the courage to make the sort of change that is needed. So I think while we do want to uh, talk about high income versus uh, low income context, I think we do want to talk about hierarchies, power imbalance and inequities also within each of these institutions, within each of these settings. Um, so um, I don't know if I'm exceeding my time, but I, I hope I'm conveying um, um, uh, sort of important areas that um, where I think a bifocal dialogue is needed. You can't just work 
at an individual level and you just cannot only see things, uh, one cannot just critique the institution. So there has to be a process of change that has to be incorporated from both ends. So let me stop there and see if there are other questions. Thank you. Thank you for much, so much for those introductory remarks. And it, it is really such a complex issue. And I like the way you talk about it from a bifocal lens, you know, going both ways, but also at different levels, um, you know, individual, but institutional, and, and then within that, the structural processes. Um, and Dr. Omira, would you also like to now chime in, just tell us also a little bit about yourself and how you've been working in your academic collaborations towards equity and impact? Sure. Thanks so much for inviting me. I think um, I just want to really appreciate the organizers for putting this together. Um, I might be a little disappointing as a panelist because I still have more questions uh, than answers, but um, I'm pleased to be able to share my experience. Um, I'm an associate professor of medicine and global health, and I have a joint appointment with Duke University and Moy University in Eldoret, Kenya. Um, and I also serve as the deputy director of the Duke Global Health Institute. So in this, um, in this role, I oversee faculty affairs at the Institute, um, promotions and appointments, et cetera. Um, and I also oversee international partnerships. Uh, and so in both of these areas, faculty affairs and partnerships, I draw deeply on my 15 years living in Kenya where I was really embedded in and participating in the life of Moy University much more closely than Duke. Um, and so, um, I have the benefit of that experience to help me see the playing field of academia from multiple perspectives, uh, US academia, Kenyan academia, and faculty who are kind of standing in between both of these, both of these realities. Um, and I have a somewhat firsthand understanding of the unrewarded efforts that are required um, to build uh, equitable and ethical collaborations. Um, and the sacrifices that you have to make in terms of your personal priorities or or research goals and advancement uh, in order to in order to put shared priorities first um, and how invisible these can be to your leadership, especially uh, in, you know, for example, in my case where I wasn't physically present um, at Duke. Uh, so at DGHI, we're simultaneously committed to supporting deeper long-term engagement, including bi-directional faculty exchange, um, and also to examining how to recognize real partnership building as part of, of your, your leadership growth. Um, but it's, it's not easy, and I look forward to hearing other people's experiences. Oh, and thanks for sharing um, your experience from having sort of lived things from both sides. Um, so maybe we'll delve a little bit deeper into that uh, around the next questions. Um, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Junjunwala a question. She was our first speaker. Um, the question comes from Dana Thompson in the chat, and it says, I'm wondering if Rashi can reflect on the personal and professional capacities that she has built during her equitable collaborations. Capacity building is often used to mean high income um, to low and middle income transfer of knowledge, which reinforces an inequitable narrative. Should an equitable partnerships result in capacity exchange? Can we shift this mindset and build capacity building into high income institutions, promotions, and training programs? Um, do you want to comment on that? Arshan? Yeah, absolutely. I actually uh, did write a bit of a response in the chat, um, but happy to also kind of uh, add to that. Um, I I've actually struggled, and I think I've talked with Dr. Hedgothier about this a few times, and maybe Dr. Dr. Chu, you as well. Um, I don't, I often struggle with what capacity building means because sure, I, I might know better uh, how to, I might be more facile with writing a research paper and like, you know, using research terminology and things like that. And maybe I have more experience with those things, but um, the other things that we learn from each other. Uh, so one one example I can give is I've been working uh, with the surgical uh, medical students at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda for the past three and a bit months now. I was just looking at the date. Um, quite a, quite a few months. So I've been uh, been here since January uh, working with them and. When I first got here, we were running some simulations. So we were teaching the students about how to treat and respond to traumas, um, you know, trauma emergencies and injuries. 
And the, um, the scenarios that my teammates from Harvard had written to, um, to use the scenarios, like, you know, this person got shot in the leg and they're brought in by emergency medical services. And, you know, they've been there for, they, that was 10 years ago or 10 minutes ago, sorry. Um, we had to immediately change all of those scenarios because they were totally irrelevant to the context of where I am right now and what the students will be seeing. So um, the, maybe that only highlights the ignorance of the group that I, I am working with and myself. But I think, you know, after three months being here and obviously not even close to a lifetime of experience that the students who are here have, um, he been just thinking about, I was reflecting about that with one of my mentors who's here this week, that experience, because we taught those simulations again. And uh, we were thinking about how it would not even be something we would think about to write about a gunshot wound or um, having a prompt emergency medical service, um, you know, with transporting um, people who have uh, been at the scene of an injury 10 minutes before they show up to the emergency room. So things like that um, are just small examples of learning uh, context, flexibility, um, their innovation of the surgeons who work here and the flexibility that they show in their in their in their clinical practice. All of those things are, you know, just small examples of the capacity exchange that, you know, if I work as a surgeon in a rural area in the United States, um, those things I think will stay with me as uh, as ways to work in a system with limited resources. So I think maybe that, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but I totally agree that uh, capacity building implies a unidirectional kind of benefit. And I think there's the point of a partnership is that there's exchange. And I, I feel luckily to have benefited from that. Um, I think there's always more to learn. So hope that's okay for an answer. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for those comments. I wanted to um, push that idea a little bit further. Dr. Barry has posted, you know, also that she supports capacity exchange rather than capacity building. And I was just wondering from our, the other three panelists, um, if they've had the experience that it's difficult to do capacity exchange or build capacity both ways in the sense that it's not always easy for low and middle income uh, researchers to go to the high income countries. It's almost always that the high income country folks are descending um, into our environment. And, you know, whether it's visa issues, financial issues, or just the fact that we also have to work clinically or have other duties that we couldn't just go for a, a fellowship or um, a course for two months, three, one, three months to go the other way. Um, if you've had that experience, because sure, you can still have capacity exchange if physically the high income person is always coming to you. But I do think it's more equitable if you could also benefit from going into that environment. I don't know if any of the three of you want to respond to that. Well, I had uh, some experience on uh, capacity building. We had a, a collaboration with the Nebraska University where we had the possibility to travel to Nebraska University for a exchange uh, with their staff. Uh, I've been in that uh, group, for example, having a, a scholar visitor uh, for uh, increasing our uh, skills and expertise on audiology, for example. And we had been immersed in that in, in the uh, uh, audiology clinic in the in, at Nebraska University. And we had been learning a lot, but also we received a audiology student from in Nicaragua uh, where they came and they practice here in the country and they can learn uh, everything about our system. And also they can learn uh, what our uh, uh, skills are for diagnosis uh, hearing problems in the country and also what are the gaps on accessing of uh, audiology care uh, in the country. But uh, related to research, for example, uh, when I decide to establish a collaboration with the US University or uh, from UK University, I always try to push uh, the collaboration for developing local capacity uh, because it's so important for us not only to uh, uh, generate the data 
but we need to uh, develop the capacity on uh, training and and also on getting equipment for improving the, the capacity to do so and local analysis as well. Mm, thank you for those points. And I'm glad to hear there was a positive example of a capacity exchange for your team going to the University of Nebraska as well. Um, Dr. Kumar, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, please, Dr. Chu. I think what, what I'd like to add here is that um, in global mental health, I mean, I'm speaking uh, about my own field, um, grants are always given on the premise that um, high income country researchers are coming to build capacity, coming to build systems, services, and things like that. But I think we we have all, um, many of my colleagues and, um, you know, uh, colleagues across the board have, board have agreed that what we have found is that actually we are building greater capacity of high income country researchers, uh, that the capacity to see things from the above, the access to, systems that are not easily accessible to very high level um, uh, uh, resources and kind of information and things like that also require that they should be reflexivity statement, there should be some sort of understanding mm -hmm. of how much capacity uh, poor resource context researchers and institutions uh, provide to high income country. But I am not saying this in a derogatory manner, I think there needs to be an appreciation of how much learning one gets. And in that, to that end, there has to be a duty. And I think there has to be a process of building capacity, building sensitivity to give back. And I think th that probably will take time. And I think, I hope that uh, uh, institution heads, department heads, funding uh, bodies, as well as journal editors, will enforce these ideas. Without that sort of support, this is not possible. And more importantly, I hope uh, LMIC researchers will start asking for that kind of accountability so that they receive back the sort of high-end exposure that uh, researchers get. So that, that is something that I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Omira, it just it, it, now that you sort of lived on both sides and see things from two different lenses, you know, you know, now that you're a Duke and in, in, in this Global Health Institute, what are some practical things that, you know, the department can do to support researchers coming through so that they don't, they aren't sort of torn between their desire to be ethical and collaborative and equitable, but then sort of still want to march up on that, on that path towards um, promotion. And then also, what is your thoughts about um, what Dr. Kumar said about do, do you feel that your low and mid-middle income collaborators have the agency to ask for more? Um, well, those are those are two important questions. I think um, one thing that I would really like to see happen is in some of these long-established um, partnerships that are not just that they're not just personal but institutional, that um, that high-income countries. Uh, uh, offer the same compensation to their faculty to teach courses in those institutions in the partner institutions when requested that they do for teaching at Duke. So for example, I did a lot of teaching at Moy, uh, but that is just voluntary on my own time. Um, but when I teach at Duke, I get a percent of my salary covered, right? So I think that, um, uh, you know, and likewise, when we have Moy faculty who are mentoring our students, they are doing that completely voluntarily. They they don't get compensated for that at all, um, and it's a bit and it's a it's a large burden. And so I think, um, you know, thinking about equity issues from how, how we engage our students, uh, how how faculty on both sides of the partnership engage their students um, is an important um, component. Um, I think, uh, you know. One thing that we've done at the Institute is we've set aside um, an opportunity, we've, we've created opportunities for faculty from our, our partner collaborating institutions to come and spend, spend time be a faculty in residence at the Institute, uh, which I think is a really positive. It, it tremendously enriches our, our, um, our scientific community at the Institute. 
um, and has been very um, a very positive experience. But we still have some issues with, um, you know, for example, those visiting faculty can't uh, go into clinical settings, uh, and they can't um, they can't uh, in most cases interact with um, with communities or research participants in um, in many of our uh, community based. Um, programs in Durham. And so those, that kind of, um, just like Dr. Kumar was saying, the, that kind of uh, access to, um, to research opportunities and populations that, uh, that are important for, for global health research, uh, I think is really under, undervalued the way that our, that our collaborators um, give us, you know, give us windows and, and invite us into communities um, to do this work together is something that um, that is is undervalued, and I think it's that is an inequitable part of our our faculty exchange is that actually the high income countries can't provide that same window and that same engagement, um, and uh, and it's something that we struggle with. Mm, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, just to say, there's two sort of comments in the chat and, and one question I think that's quite valuable to read. I'm just going to read the comments. Um, Justice Owa mentioned that, you know, in terms of capacity building, we need systemic changes. Um, but oftentimes in certain countries, there's political instability. And sometimes you need those politicians to help make systemic changes. So I think he's just pointing that out as a challenge. Um, and then another person, Gubrit Rana, pointed out that interprofessional education the information professionals, librarians are very important in building, um, in, in conducting research, and they're often le left out as part of, of these collaborations. And I think that's also an important point. Um, Dr. Eichbaum has pointed out that one of the problems for many of the high income collaborators, particularly in Africa, is that they select the most well known universities or the ones with the most well established research tracks already. Um, such as University of Global Health Equity, McCary in Uganda, and several of the South African universities, but there's obviously quite a lot of other universities that are smaller. And how do they get involved? How do they get you know, opportunities to be collaborators, grant funding? I would argue that that also probably is similar for the lesser known institutions in high income countries too. But um, I don't know if any of you three panelists who've been working um, or, you know, wearing a high income country hat and or an LMIC hat, if you see ways for lesser known or less well-established research centers in LMICs to also get involved. I don't know if I if I um, have a comprehensive answer, but one thing that um, that my team is working on, uh, the faculty, at, mostly led by by um, our team at Moy. Um, is uh, creating research collaborations within Kenya that that leverage our expertise at different institutions and making sure that we include these new universities um, in our um, in our regional collaborations. So um, really, you know, the the mentorship is coming from the sen our senior um, collaborators at Moy University, but uh, there's been there's been I think an effective way to get those new universities into the research scene. Uh, really is to foster that kind of regional collaboration um, with more more research experienced universities, um, making sure to invite those those newer institutions into that. Yeah, and I mean, here in South Africa, there are, you know, historically disadvantaged universities um, as a legacy from the apartheid days, and definitely grant funders are looking for participation from those universities in research partnerships um, and big consortiums now. So there is sort of an, you know, a reason why high income partners as well as within South Africa to hunt these universities down and find collaborators. So I think that is a nice incentive that can be a win-win. Mm -hmm. um, I was wanting to ask Dr. Kumar a question it related to the editorial you published in The Lancet about what should equity and global health research look like? And one of the recommendations that you had, and maybe this was also part of your comment about challenging the practices, but you had said develop mechanisms that evaluate partnerships in collaborative research, including measures of fairness and the quality of ethical and cultural response engagement. And I was just wondering if you had some thoughts about how that could be done. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shu. I, I think um, uh, 
I can't say that I have uh, or my colleagues have mapped out what that might look like, but one suggestion is for a forum like this to start talking about some kind of a scorecard. I think what we need to do is to better understand um, uh, very specific uh, aspects where things are going wrong, but also to get a better sense of uh, the sort of things that need rectification. So for example, um, you know, the things that bother me are also attitudes of researchers. Uh, what, how many um, LMIC researchers benefited and, and in what uh, ways, uh, how easy was it to navigate? How did the LMIC institution leverage that opportunity? So there has to be an inward thinking too. I, this, there is also a message here for middle income country, lower and in middle income country, lower income country, uh, national level discourse on how to promote research, how to promote um, uh, an equitable uh, kind of a dialogue around uh, how knowledge can be generated, how issues of justice, issues of partnership, collaboration. So there has to be an inward reflection. And then, of course, a, a, a cross-cultural uh, kind of a global dialogue there. So some kind of a scorecard, some kind of a reflection on um, uh, understanding what are the parameters of collaboration. Uh, I think there has to be a greater uh, a, a greater dialogue, a greater understanding. And we think funders must and and uh, publishers and uh, you know key think tanks, decision makers around uh, academic research uh, partnerships need to become a little bit more responsive and alert to this. I, and I think I also like the point that someone made about the middle income countries that, you know, I, I think jumping from high income to low income, there is a lot that happens in between. Um, and I think we need to learn from middle income countries about if they have tackled some barriers that, uh, that even high income countries need to learn, you know, what, what is it that they could do to map that sort of a distance. Uh, so maybe the discourse has also become a bit static at it, and it needs a little bit more nuance. Um, but those are my reflections. I can't say that, uh, you know, I have answers, but uh, thank you for this opportunity to deliberate on this. Back to you, Dr. Chu. Thanks, Dr. Kumar. And I think if the answers were easy, we wouldn't be having a three hour session about this. Um, I was just going to put Melody Ryan on the spot. She made a comment in the chat about middle income countries, but specifically about non-academic partners. Um, but I was wondering, Melody, if you could elaborate on that a bit more. Yeah, so um, often we have things that would be classified as scholarship of teaching and learning that we're uh, doing with, with our partners, um, but they aren't academics and they haven't come up with the, the idea necessarily. Um, we include them in the discussions and the planning, and so clearly they deserve an authorship position. But if they didn't conceive of it or write the paper or do the analysis or execute it really, um, and they're, they're really just the site, um, it seems a conflict is there between the publication ethics, right, of, of being, say, a first author and and wanting to place them in a prominent position in authorship. I think you bring up a point that is not uncommon. Um, and I was just wondering, as part of the sort of capacity exchange, if uh, open and honest conversation with those partners about what it is that they're hoping to learn and achieve out of this, because if it's that they you know, don't wanna go further in, in learning the more research methodology, being you know, the leader on the next grant, um, because they're not academic, uh, that could be fine, but perhaps that they do have a desire to transition into that. And here in South Africa, we have a lot of NGOs. Maybe they aren't considered academic, but they are certainly powerhouses in grant acquisitions. And so in some way they are academic um, and they certainly have benefited from early partnerships where they got to learn a lot about how to write the paper, analyze the data, even though at first they were just sort of the technical partners or the you know, sort of the connect, the local connection, if you will. And I just, I just want to make a comment about this. I, I think that um, similar to sort of the the guidelines around um, around open data, I think the guidelines around authorship are really not well suited to the kind of partnerships that we have because 
um, I really push back against this, this uh, perception that research starts at the point of data analysis. There, is so there are so many important contributions that happen uh, to improve the quality of the data and, our, and the way that we understand the data and the way that, um, and the way that we uh, uh, build out the execution of the data collection that are so central and so core to being able to do rigorous, um, rigorous research uh, that are in between the protocol and the, um, and the data analysis, right? And those are completely undervalued in the kind of authorship criteria that, that we use um, in most of our biomedical journals. And so I just, I, I think that like trying to hammer our, our like beautiful round partnerships into this square hole that, you know, some committee has decided what authorship should be is just, I would just push back against that. I don't, yeah. Mm, yeah, thanks for that comment. Can I make a uh, comment Dr. also? Yes, Dr. Gonzalez, go ahead. I'm, I'm part of the consortium right now that we are working. This, this consortium is built by seven, eight, 10 university from six university from Central America and seven, eight, in four universities from the US. Uh, we are right now uh, discussing about the uh, authorship in this consortium because we have been working on developing a harmonized protocol for a cohort study that we are going to establish in Central America and India. Uh, but we haven't agreed who will be uh, the first author in the papers that we are planning to why, for example, it will be the the the, the first author will be the researcher from the U.S. institution or from the low middle income country institution. I think this is a huge opportunity to talk about that because uh, the researcher from the low middle income country has also the capacity and the right uh, to be the first author uh, for this. Uh, in this consortium, because we have been working very hard, for example, on uh, giving the ideas and writing the, the 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 protocol, the harmonized protocol, but also we will have the responsibility to collect all the data. Uh, and, and maybe we are we we are uh, we are not going to analyze the data because all all the data will be uh, centralized in in a, a in a in one of the u.s uh, institution and they will share the data with us uh, later but uh, we can collaborate on the uh, analysis as well I think uh, putting everything on paper and, and putting all the or defining the roles uh, on this aspect will be so fantastic uh, on developing the partnership. Yeah, thank you for those comments. And I mean, I think that really dovetails from Dr. O'Meara's comments just about, you know, the traditional definition of authorship and, you know, I see there are some comments about journal fees as well. I mean, we've had in South Africa, we're a middle income country. And so sometimes we get discounts if all our authors um, are from a middle or lower middle income country. But ironically, when we put our high income country authors on, then we have an incredible APC charge. And the only mm -hmm. way we can pay it is if then they become the corresponding authors. And so we often have to shift around the authorship role to benefit mm -hmm. them because they're on the paper. But if we took them off the paper, we could actually publish with them. Like we could afford to publish it ourselves. So we always found that slightly ironic. Yeah. Um, I see quite a lot of other comments here, but I think perhaps we've got three minutes left. I'd like to ask each of our panelists, just the final question, if you could make one change in your institution around making partnerships more equitable, but not disincentivizing the person at that institution who also wants an academic track, what would it be? I'm going to start with Dr. Kumar, then go to Dr. O'Meara, and then finish with uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Dr. Kumar? Sure, it's a very tough question. But I, I uh, would propose uh, building uh, capacity of key uh, players in the university around uh, why they need to strengthen uh, resource base and leadership in their faculty. So. 
that is that is an area in which I will uh, kind of uh, work. So leaders, system leaders need to uh, know how to uh, build capacity and to uh, shape leadership in their staff and researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omira. It's a really hard question and it's of course the holy grail, right? Um, but where I've seen progress being made um, is when uh, people are willing, pe partners on both sides uh, of the collaboration, both the you know the North American-based institution and the and usually the international institution, when they come together and they're willing to be very transparent about what their priorities are, and that the collaboration can collectively ask, is it equitable? Are we prioritizing shared priorities? If not, why? How do we change? How do we fix that? Um, for the for the collaboration to operate in that way, I think is uh, those are the instances where I've seen I've seen really positive change, right? If your if your partnership is strong enough that you can reflect together and um, and and be just be very transparent about this is what this is what I'm hoping to get out of it. What are you hoping to get out of it? What are our shared priorities, both in terms of our you know our research content, but also in terms of our research product, right? Uh, and and agreeing together if, if the partnership needs to change. Thank you for that. I, and Dr. Gonzalez? I agree with my partner fellow, uh, panel fellows, sorry, uh, that bringing all the key or relevant actors to uh, uh, develop a common agenda for reducing the gaps, it will be the key aspect for improving the health inequity because having a common agenda between local and international partnership will be a tremendous impact for reducing the gap um, for a, among vulnerable and disadvantaged population as well. Thank you. With that, I want to conclude this session. I want to thank the panelists so much for their time and also to all the participants. It was a very lively chat going on and I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody's question. Um, we're gonna take a five minute break, but in the break, there's going to be another link to a mentee poll about what change do you want at your university? For all the participants who obviously we haven't heard from all of you. So we'd love to hear from you and look forward to engaging more on the second half.
I want to encourage everyone to make their way back to our session um, as we're having folks filter back in off of a hopefully um, restful stretch break. Um, I just want to share a couple of things. One is thank you for those who have let us know where you're calling from. Um, we, I will post this chat uh, this link in the chat again, but you can see that we have colleagues from around the world engaged and appreciate those of you who've joined despite um, time challenge differences and other work commitments. I really do appreciate your participation today. Um, the other thing I just quickly want to share, and hopefully you can see that, it looks like folks can, can see that map of where folks are calling in from. Um, we did put in the chat over the break, um, what changes you're hoping to see at your own institutions. We'll be collecting this in a variety of formats. So there will be continued discussion through the next session. And then we will also be collecting this um, during an open discussion and through a follow-up survey. So please continue to share your thoughts. I'll repost that link as well. Without further ado, I'm excited to invite um, Elijah Pencil from Yale University, who's gonna be our moderator for the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bethany. Um, and thank you all for joining this section as well. It's really been a privilege and an honor uh, listening into the previous section. And how I want to frame, uh, frame the next section is I think it, it's more of um, uh, a call to action section, uh, regardless of the topic we have for us. So we're going to discuss championing investor level transformation, uh, changes, the change strategies from investor leadership. And I think that the, from the last session, what we have all learned is that one, we have to encourage equity in global health research. And two, uh, we also have to do it now. So there is really, it, it looks like, it's very depressing listening to the, into the first uh, section. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things going on that it's not kosher and we have to change this now. So hopefully uh, uh, this second session is going to help introduce us to this. And uh, the best way to start this change as well identified would be from the HI, uh, high income country institutions and why are we putting charge on them? And at this point, I would want to crave your indulgence to use a rather uh, painful metaphor, but necessary to depict what we are in now, the nature of the inequity in global partnership can be likened to um, a, a photo that we probably in 2020 saw too often, George Floyd, where the officer had um, his knee on his neck. I can say that that is what probably our academic institutions are doing in high income countries. They have their knee on the neck, trying to suffocate uh, global health advances and research. And how are they doing the, uh, this um, knee to uh, neck process? They are actually affecting one, faculty and students in their own institution, and two, they are affecting institutions in the global south also. And then our collaborators, and we heard about the APC and uh, uh, the authorship rules and what have you, that makes it very difficult for people to do this. So hopefully in the next session, we would be able to help them. Sometimes they are not doing much because they don't know what to do. So this section is to give them the tools to be able to decolonize what's going on. Um, I'm going to next turn to uh, Constance Rehan from Virginia Commonwealth University. And she's going to talk to us ways to promote culture change on university campus. So how can we help our leadership to change the situation? So Constance, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad to be here, especially as someone who is not in public health. Um, but I have some comments. Um, so 
Way back in the fall of 2020, I published a piece called 10 Ways to Promote Culture Change on a University Campus. I drafted it in 2019 before the pandemic. And in the fall of 2020, we were waiting for the vaccine and hopeful that soon everyone would be vaccinated, COVID would recede quickly and life on campus would return to normal. It was a piece that was focused primarily on communicating the need for change on campus and on gathering supporters. It's, it's a piece that's in, in your bibliography is full of confidence, lots of active verbs and declarative statements. It was written after all, based on my more than 30 years of university experience. Many of those spent in positions that had associate in the title. That is to say, lots of responsibility, but little authority or power and I was pretty sure I knew a thing or two. Maybe I still do, but I can't pretend that our campuses are the same as they used to be. And I can't pretend that the students, faculty, and staff who form our campus communities are the same either. The past four years have changed us all. If anything, they've clarified the need to transform our institutions. The impact of the pandemic, the intensified calls for racial justice, the organized attacks on higher education, the budgetary crises spurred by a looming recession, call us to remake our campuses and to do so quickly. But in the US, we are extremely tired, right? We have watched colleges and universities close, consolidate and cut programs. We've watched political leaders propose legislation that attacks the fundamental values of our institution. Florida's House Bill 999, for instance, provides just one example. That bill, as I'm sure many of you know, would prohibit public universities in Florida from funding projects that espouse diversity, equity, and inclusion or critical race theory rhetoric would ban general education classes that give a full picture of US history, as well as quote, academic programs in gender studies, critical race theory and intersectionality. And it would give boards of trustees undue influence over faculty hiring and review. Even as it's been amended, it is a depressing assault on higher education. It's exhausting and dispiriting to face, to face the challenges that we do and to face them day in and day out. And perhaps more troubling than the Florida legislation itself is the recent report that not a single president of a public college or university in Florida is willing to voice their views on the proposed reforms. But we, we need to, be remain, to remain optimistic and committed. The intensity of the assaults is a reminder of the successes we have already had in shifting our systems of higher education from their structurally racist and sexist roots. Not nearly enough, of course, but attacks from the political right show their anxiety with the impending shifts that will continue to challenge the status quo. Similarly, attacks on the economic cost and value of higher education reflect anxiety with the changes um, that have already occurred, such as the increase in the number of low-income students, our support for diversity, and um, the increase in the number of women and BIPOC individuals in leadership roles. It also indicates a recognition of what the next generation needs from higher ed education may not be what our institutions have been providing. We need to acknowledge this latter point. We all, regardless of our political positions, share a deep anxiety about what kind of future our children and grandchildren will face and how we can best prepare them for its challenges. We can't let either our exhaustion or partisan divides overwhelm our commitment. So what are we to do? Well, I would say we need to double down on the basics. First, we need to keep saying and doing the things we know must be said and done in whatever situations we find ourselves and to whomever we are speaking. It is awkward and uncomfortable, but it is important to articulate both the changes that need to occur and the dangerous consequences that will result from not taking action. There will be times when we will be the specter at the feast, no doubt, but unless our campuses acknowledge 
the importance of the needed change, there will be no momentum to move the process forward. We need to make sure that we use all the tools and strategies available to us, such as the Change Leadership Toolkit developed by the Pulius Institute at the University of Southern California and recently uh, concisely introduced in an essay in Academic Leader. Next, we keep pushing forward the data and the documents that we know need to be read, analyzed, and discussed. Remind everyone you meet of the specific impact of potential budget cuts. Give them the details in specific terms, like every $100,000 cut is the equivalent of approximately one in instructional faculty member. Share the data you have about the impact of the programs you're, produce, you're proposing on student retention or whatever their area of emphasis is. Point people on your campus toward the report of the Boyer 2030 Commission, which emphasizes that equity or that excellence without equity is simply privilege reproducing privilege and that equity without excellence is promise unfulfilled. Yes, you will become a broken record, but it will be for a good reason. Unless we can ensure that all individuals who seek a college education are able to earn their degrees, we will be unable to achieve the more advanced and specific social and economic goals that rely on a well-educated citizenry. Additionally, we must acknowledge that the old paradigms need to change, and we've got to listen to the folks that have new ideas. Kathy Davidson, one of the best thinkers around on how to change undergraduate education summarizes the situation beautifully. You cannot counter structural inequality with goodwill. You need to create new structures that support equality. And the problem often is that those of us who've been working in higher education may not be in the best position to see what those new structures might be. Moreover, we keep teaching the next generation of students grounded in the assumptions that were taught to us, and we resist revising the structures that govern how our faculty do their work. In other words, we dissuade our students and our new colleagues from being innovative. But there's no place for our arrogance. If we knew how to achieve our goals, we would have erased equity gaps and structural racism by now. We need to be ready to listen to good ideas regardless of their source, even if they come from those outside our institutions or from our critics. We must do all that we can to keep our egos out of it and keep our eyes on the common good. That means we have got to collaborate across institutions and across political and cultural divides. As much as possible, we have to not worry about our careers or who gets credit. It's harder than it looks. It seems inevitable that once we've attained a position of visible leadership on our campuses, we want to keep them or use them as stepping stones to a more advanced position. We're all concerned with our financial security and being able to create a solid retirement fund. Still, these understandable concerns can impede our ability to act. Think again of the silence of Florida's public university presidents. We have to quash our inner or not so inner introvert and talk to people about the changes we desire to achieve. We need to recognize that every encounter of the day, be it in the office, the classroom, or the nail salon, provides us with an opportunity to share our data, our ideas, and our proposals with someone who can help in our initiative either directly or indirectly. Most of us are trying to lead from the middle, and that requires us to influence our leaders as well as our peers and subordinates. Recently, I learned of a classic sociological essay by Mark Granovetter. His work demonstrates that it's through interpersonal connections that small scale interaction becomes translated into large scale patterns. And this small scale influence is spread through our contacts and our contacts contacts. Our opportunities to influence change, in other words, multiply. We have the power to transform strangers into advocates. Finally, we have to take care of ourselves and recognize that we're here for the long haul. We need to attend to our own wellness through whatever strategies work for us. And we need to recruit individuals who can work with us and when the time comes, take over our mission. 
Succession planning in all professions has take on, taken on increased importance since the pandemic. And we need to make sure that those of us working for change are as invested in identifying and developing the skills of those who will become the next generation of leaders. Each of us has a responsibility to share what we have learned and to encourage those around us to become more involved in the institutions and organizations we lead. Ultimately, we need to keep reminding ourselves that the changes we are promoting matter. As our budgets, our governments, and our stacks of ungraded papers all weigh heavily upon us, we need to keep focused on our students, our campuses, and the changes that our societies demand we make. Our institutions can't stand still, and they need us to help push them into the future. Thank you. Those are my comments. No, thank you very much, Constance. That's really great. And you have set the stage. I think those of us uh, uh, um, on this um, uh, uh, discussion, uh, we are now empowered and you have, you have given us the tools. And so it's now left to us. You have advised us to stay optimistic and also be committed. Uh, we, you have advised us to forget about the back, background noise and the exhaustion and the partisan divide and what have you. Um, you have also promised us that this is going to be awkward and uncomfortable. I didn't want to take that, but I think uh, from what you have said, that is how we have to do this. A lot of advocacy on our part, a lot of showcasing evidence, what we are doing, we have to actually speak up and uh, we have to keep going. We have to persist. We shouldn't stop anywhere. And the part that I also find it a bit uh, uh, exhaustive on my part is that don't worry, don't worry about your career. So that requires a lot of sacrifice. So I hope all of us will do that and we'll start thinking outside the box. And lastly, you are saying that we should provide our leaders. We should actually support them. Sometimes they don't know it all, but we should make it. Thank you, thank you very much for okay. such a wonderful exposition. Yeah. Good, so we would now search way with that uh, sort of charge and uh, encouragement and empowerment. I would uh, turn to the panel discussion now, and we would have, uh, three panelists joining me on this. And uh, we're going to now discuss how to advocate for change. Constance is asking us to bring changes. So how do we advocate that? And st strategies from university leadership. So with me uh, today uh, are Collins uh, Ahimboa, Maureen Connelly, and Jimmy Vormick. And I apologize if I uh, did not pronounce your name the way your mother pronounces, forgive me. My name is Pencil and people call me Pencil. So I've come used to that, so forgive me. So um, because of time, we will not have, uh, uh, we can't uh, introduce everybody, but what I would want to give to our panelists, uh, can you just take two to three minutes to introduce yourself and comment on how you use your academic or leadership roles to drive issues related to health equity and impact. So maybe maybe we'll start with Collins. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Elijah and Constance. Thank you for those powerful remarks. And let me also say thank you to Bethany for the leadership in getting us to this point. My name is Colin Sari Mbua, and we Georgia State University. Before here, I was at St. Louis University, Dean of the College for Public Health and Social Justice. Before then, I was department chair at Penn State uh, for many years. And I say this to sort of foreground the uh, perspective that I wish to share with you. Um, the, about a couple of years ago, I, I did a blog where I said the, the political and economic architecture of colonization is structural racism. I don't really believe that we can uh, seriously address decolonization unless we understand anti-racism at the structural level. And that really undercuts a part of the um, what uh, 
uh, Constance has shared with us, and that the issue of unfairness and in global collaboration is what brings us here. There seem to be two uh, areas of foresight that uh, should be important in the work that we do. One is uh, the collaboration of maybe predatory behavior of uh, scholars in high income country in, in the nature of partnership with uh, scholars in, in other part of the world. And that is one. And then the second part is how even when you are the uh, scholars in high income country uh, doing all the right thing, the way in which your institution uh, create barrier that encourages and motivate the type of work that you are doing. So I tend to think of things in the way we produce knowledge in the academy and this duality of the good and bad up and down. There are two that we tend to focus on in, in uh, dismantling uh, effort to dismantle structural racism. And that is normal, abnormal, and then advantage and disadvantage. Uh, so when we call attention to the unfair advantage of the disadvantage of a different population. We will agree we have had disparity, for example, uh, but would not agree that those who are minoritized, there is uh, an unfair advantage of the group that uh, benefit from services that they don't benefit from. So I think that uh, can help to frame the way we look at uh, decolonization and look at our system of reward in the university, where we say, whereas what we are calling unfairness um, is understood, but those who benefit from the system will say that the opposite of that is normal. They do not have uh, any advantage or unfair advantage, it's just normal. So if you look at research teaching service, tripartite admission of university, that that is normal. That in fact, the distribution of weighting of metrics for measuring uh, success uh, for research and for teaching and service, that is normal. Uh, but we are saying that somehow it's unfair in the system because um, it, it creates a, a, a way of devaluing the commitment of scholars uh, to be proximate with the environment in which they do the work because of the way the system is. So we have to be able to say that the current system provide unfair advantage to those who are within the system in a way that doesn't allow global health scholar to be rewarded for the work they've done. And then draw on the lesson that is being employed in looking at some of the same issue uh, in um, minoritized population, whether it's partic uh, community-based participatory research, the, the uh, idea that the component of service being totally separate from research is totally uh, unacceptable, that there's a whole part, it is a huge part of engagement that is uh, informed by scholarship and that that has to be rewarded. It's almost a re-examination, not almost it's a, a re-examination of what uh, the research teaching service mission is supposed to mean. And, and so that really, to me, is the focus of what we need to be looking at. It's been done before in interdisciplinary work. I can talk about that. Uh, economic scholars have a way of tackling that, and I can talk about that. Um, we also have to change the language as we engage students, but I think we need to be focused on what are we doing in the university and how do we examine the current unfair structure to, to have anyone listen or the leadership listen to why we need to change the current structure. So I'll leave it there for now. Uh, thank you very much, Collins. That's really great. And uh, so there's a lot to be done. Maureen, uh, we are take on this. Um, thank you. I'm so honored to be with all of you today on this panel, but in this entire program. Um, and really appreciate in my role as an academic administrator, learning from colleagues about opportunities to uh, really uh, challenge and change the way we reward uh, in universities. Um, I'm a general internist by training and a professor in a department that hasn't existed at any other medical school in the country till now, a health system science. 
Um, and I also am Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Community Affairs at a relatively new medical school, the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. And I have a, a, the advantage of two experiences, having also served as Dean for Faculty Affairs at Harvard Medical School for many years, and now at a new school, thinking about this issue of university change. I don't think we all have to move to brand new universities to change things, and I, but I will say that there are opportunities available when we're in new centers um, or new environments. Um, I would also say that um, our role as administrators and leaders is to um, look for opportunities to support creative work, innovative work, to not accept the status quo, uh, the phrase we've always done it that way is probably the worst uh, information we can uh, communicate in our um, environment. And, and our job is not to think from the vantage point of the past, but really looking forward. I feel inspired so much by all the comments we've heard about what it takes to make change in universities and, and agree completely that um, we have to bring the lens of anti-racism, of anti-colonialism to the work we're doing in global health. Um, and I think we're at a perfect moment to do that in so many ways. As you said, Dr. Pencil, in the sort of post-George Floyd era, there is a, a different consciousness I see among uh, leaders uh, around the country in academic settings and in my institution in particular. And I think that um, we should leverage the moment in a sense, um, because we are accountable to our colleagues, to our students, our trainees, our partners, um, and the groundswell that we feel to bring um, a more equitable lens to all the work we do is an opportunity for us as academic leaders. So I, I think we're at a wonderful moment for tackling this important issue that we're dealing with today. Um, and, and I love that point, um, uh, Dr. Arhan, you are, that you made, um, and apologies for my pronunciation, um, just about not separating service um, from the research work, or whether it's service, whether it's mentorship. Um, there are so many roles that we play in the academy. And um, I, I think one of the lessons I've learned along the way is uh, if we're not going to reward the things that we value, such as service, such as mentorship, um, uh, education, uh, our promotion criteria are pretty hollow, and they really only speak to a small segment of our community. So um, I look forward to this discussion and thinking more specifically about some of the incentives, um, and I'm very inspired by the comments I've heard from uh, Dr. Relihan and others about ways we can make a difference. So very happy to be with all of you. Thank you very much, Maureen. And you have also reiterated the fact that those of us who think we are being affected probably need to be very creative and that our leaders may be ready to support us when we bring this creativity on board. So the charge is back to us. Uh, Jimmy, uh, your remarks on this. Thank you very much, uh, Elijah, and uh, uh, to the panel, hi. Um, and I, I just also want to say thank you for this opportunity uh, to make a few remarks um, and also to receive the, the, the comments and listen to the wonderful, rich comments that you've all made. So thank you for that. So yes, I am Jimmy Volmink, and I am an Emeritus Professor of Global Health um, and the immediate past Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at, at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, I, I would describe my, uh, my passion over the course of my career as being having been driven by uh, the desire really to, to make a meaningful difference in the lives of people, particularly those experiencing social disadvantage. And I've tried to give expression to, to this passion in, in different ways over the course of my career. Uh, so just to name a, a few, um, as, as a primary care physician, I have served low-income communities in rural Swaziland and also in townships in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, with respect to, to my research, um, you've heard of some of the bibliometric uh, uh, research that's been done, but uh, in, during the course of my career, I've really focused primarily on uh, 
evaluating the effects of treatments for conditions associated with poverty, uh, such as tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and, and malnutrition. And, and this work has been coupled uh, with efforts to promote um, the translation of, of research into policy and practice for maximal um, impact. Um, perhaps a, a further strong feature of my academic work has been involvement, my involvement in research capacity development and in mentoring of early uh, career health professionals uh, in South Africa, but also in other African countries. The last remark I want to make uh, just about how I get into this area of interest is that I, um, I have been, uh, I was appointed as the first Black Dean of Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch, uh, which is a formerly whites only uh, institution. And I fulfilled this leadership role for 11 years. Um, through, throughout my tenure as, as Dean of, of the faculty, one of the key strategic goals that I pursued was advancing institutional transformation um, through a promoting diversity, inclusion, and, and equity. And perhaps I'll just finish at this stage by mentioning uh, an important lesson or some lessons that I've learned about the quest to be transformative as a leader. Um, I think for me, uh, there are a couple of things that have emerged from this. First of all, I think I've learned that acad academic leaders should should articulate or be able to articulate a compelling vision for change. And that has to be repeated uh, many times. They also have to put in place strategies to support change. And, and thirdly, I think they need to work with others to co-create the desired outcomes. And I think if you bring those three things together, then I think you can hope that transformation will happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy, and congratulations on what you have done, and also especially being the first Black Dean of a white uh, sort of uh, uh, huge institution. That's great. And also your insight into transformation that uh, we have to articulate a vision for change and strategies to support that and then work with others. So again, as was said by the two panels, you, we should all be involved and we should contribute when we support our leaders. Um, so uh, if you don't mind, then my next question will go to Maureen and Jimmy. And this is because of your strategic positions. We often think of investors as unchangeable, steeped in deep traditions, and academic norms. As we try to change our institutions to improve our collaborations and impact, how would you respond to this image of unchangeable institution, tradition? How do you combat that? Hmm. Shall I go first, Maureen, or shall I? Uh, Ma Maureen, you are muted. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm happy to take a stab if that's okay, okay. Uh, that's Professor Go ahead. Um, and Just to say, I, I actually think it's a bit of a myth that universities don't change. Um, in fact, they are very living, breathing organizations and having observed multiple changes, even in my relatively new five-year-old institution, we're already updating our promotion criteria. So I think that... Um, it may be slow and it may be painful, but universities are responsive to um, the the current zeitgeist related to all sorts of aspects, um, whether it's, you know, there are many fulcra that um, influence uh, what happens. And some of the things I've been thinking about are um, the, the issue of tenure clocks. I think until there was a significant portion of primary caregivers in um, academia, the issue of extending a tenure clock didn't exist, but with that change in the demographics of who the faculty are, 
That question has been raised and addressed by many institutions. And I saw Dr. Mari's comment that may not be where we want to go in terms of global health, a, a separate topic. But just to say, um, you know, as the move toward team science has become important, promotion criteria have changed to recognize that. Um, we heard a bit about the scholarship of um, education, and I think many institutions have done that. So, so I think the hopeful uh, answer is that universities really are quite responsive, both to internal and external forces, which I hope we'll talk a bit about in terms of facilitating change. But um, that answer that you know we're set in stone, um, I think, is just never true, even at the oldest, most established institutions, at least in my experience. And there are opportunities. Uh, for sort of improving the path uh, to advancement. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Yes, I, I, I would agree with, with Maureen completely. I, I think academic institutions are often among the most resistant to change. And I also think it's true that the older and more established universities are probably the most impervious to any calls for transformation. That is true, but having said that, I, I think change is possible, and I've certainly seen that happen. Uh, uh, some of the, the factors, uh, and there are probably quite a few, I, I've already mentioned the importance of engaged leadership. I, I think that, and I won't go into that in detail, but uh, I think that is critical. But I think there are also other levers of change uh, that, that we could look to. And, you know, I, I find it quite remarkable that, you know, uh, universities are really quite sensitive to a, a perception of reputational risk. <laughs> and I think that can be exploited to the benefit of, of, of the change agenda. So I think um, institutional reviews and accreditation processes can assist in bringing about change in higher education institutions. I, I don't think we should forget about students. I've seen many times how student uprising and other activities of students can bring about change. Uh, most recently, probably uh, in many instances, there have been calls for decolonization of curricula. And I think students have been very much in the forefront of those calls. And I think that has had impact. And then the other thing that universities are quite uh, sensitive to are financial uh, issues. So this, these can either be financial incentives to change or financial pressures to change. And that can come from a variety of quarters. So those are some of the things that I, can, I think can help move us forward. But yes, I, I do think that patience is required <laughs> because the pace of change can often be quite slow. Thank you very much uh, for the two of you to really giving us an insight. And I'm hoping that all of us on this call today are taking note of that, that uh, it's a myth to say that the institutions cannot change. They can change. So it is up to us. And uh, Jimmy shared with us some of the uh, external, internal pressures and sensitivities that we have to. So we are now well poised to do that. Um, Elijah, so could, could I give a couple of examples? Okay, no, go ahead. Um, the, the issue of change, um, in, in uh, when I was department chair at Penn State, um, the department just by its very nature, by behavioral health, was designed to be interdisciplinary. And the reward system at the time was focused on um, the traditional metrics of um, individual first author or last author. If you're doing an interdisciplinary work, you imagine a methodologist who has to be on several projects and, and it's no really way of rewarding their work because they are neither first or last author. We have to make the case that for interdisciplinary work to flourish, we need to reimagine a way of assigning reward. It cannot be based solely on one or two person on the authorship paper. And that also cut across into grant um, reward distribution. Uh, if you hear about cost sharing today, indirect cost distribution being more democratic in institution is relatively new. It used to be the case that uh, when you write a grant, only the PI, uh, institute department gets rewarded with the indirect costs. It took a lot of transformation to say every key personnel 
uh, should have benefit, including their unit, for institutions to start looking at the reward system within their research enterprise to say it doesn't have to go to PI alone. I've served on P&T committee at the department, college, and university level. What was uh, impressive to me at the university level is when deans come to the committee to talk about what matter to them. When economics was talked about, the economics, uh, the dean that represent the economics uh, scholars will say, if you are looking at the economics document, uh, you have to look at uh, the depth of paper. If you were looking at 20, 30 publication as a threshold of meeting reward, that doesn't apply to us. Uh, for every five paper, we probably have one and it's longer, it takes, they make that case. And on top of that, that the way we assign authorship is alphabetical order. Don't look at giving credit to first or last. So a, a discipline can bring about a change. If you were to imagine a department of global health that says everything we are talking about, we need to reframe it and, and make the case within the university that we are a different animal in terms of the way we are drawing from uh, the work that is done in, in economics, that is done in interdisciplinary work to reframe the way we add a portion reward and then move that through the system. That can become a framework that others can hang on to. It has been done, it is being done. It just takes an engagement and a meaningful dialogue to, to get to that point. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a, a few questions in the chat, but I would paraphrase them and maybe ask Maureen and Jimmy to give your take on that. Um, in your time, Maureen, at Harvard and now your uh, university, new university, uh, did you see any changes, say, to promotion criteria over time uh, uh, during your time? Um, I have, and not just at Harvard, but at many institutions around the country. And I think the the most poignant example may be around um, the commitment that faculty make to supporting equity, inclusion, and diversity. There are many institutions that now require, in the U.S. at least, and I'm speaking to my experience here, um, statements about contributions to diversity, whether it's at the hiring phase or the promotion phase. And I think that that attention um, is an example of giving credit perhaps for service and for mentorship, um, also looking at equity ideally in the research that we do. So that would be one example um, that I would say. The, the other thing to pick up on the comments about authorship in journals, I do think that some of the external forces that influence change are, are critical because uh, to the point that universities can be shamed and care about their reputation is important. And so the ability to be co-first and co-senior author, it doesn't address the alphabetizing, which I think is an ideal way to go, but at least there are opportunities for faculty to highlight a, a colleague, a trainee, whoever it might be. Um, I think the potential um, to provide explanations of contributions, so to annotate a bibliography and highlight in footnotes. I um, you know, partnered with this individual and uh, we co-led a project it is a very important way to inform our promotions committee about how um, one is moving ahead. And then I also think we're often reviewers at journals and can expect more of those who are submitting papers in terms of their documentation of who's done what. Uh, to make sure the appropriate people are getting credit. So that's a little orthogonal to your question, but I just want to say, I think there are a number of areas where um, the influence of what's changing externally can influence the university's promotion criteria. Jimmy, any experience during your time? Yeah, just thanks, Elijah. Yeah, so, so you know, historically at Stellenbosch, you know, the focus has been largely on on research and teaching, which is valued for promotion, for performance assessment, et cetera. And I think what has in the last few years been added to that is societal impact. And, and that can be expressed in different ways, but I think that is a, a development that has taken place and that is now included in the considerations. Thank you very much. Um, to the, our panelists, I want to switch gears. And you've told us about how uh, we can really uh, uh, work on the vulnerability and sensitivities of in information. Now I want you to advise um, if on an individual faculty in your institution 
wanted to champion the types of changes described in the draft statement about promotion criteria and whatever, what first steps would you advise them to take? So now more concrete first step for a faculty who wants to lead the charge for these changes that are contained in the document. Anyone can go first. <laughs> I mean, I'll pick up on one comment in the document, which I think is so important, is about how faculty spend their time. If they're not at their home institution, but they're at their host institution, they're teaching and doing capacity exchange and building, um, is that considered um, sufficient for the teaching obligation at the home institution where one is getting promoted? And, and I thought I'd bring up a model that I've learned about from colleagues at, at Dell University, um, where uh, they are building a global health partnership in Puebla, Mexico, and they have started a, a migrant health course where there are students from Puebla and students from Dell in the course together. So those faculty are maybe meeting their home institution's expectation for teaching, but they're also building collaborative partnerships through the technology we've all become so facile with. <laughs> Thing, you know, due to our experiences with COVID. So I think um, one way to meet those expectations for local teaching is to find the ways to build partnerships across institutions um, uh, as a way to sort of fulfill both sense of obligations. The kind of teaching um, we may be doing in, with partners at um, host um, institutions are just as that kind of teaching is just as valuable at home. Uh, so I think that if there's a way to do both, um, that could be a great advantage for um, a faculty member trying to meet the expectations of their university and do more equitable global health research and work. So what, what I might add is that, uh, two things. Uh, number one, the, the provost don't change policy. Deans don't change policies. In fact, department head might influence that. You, you have to resort to um, what we understand as community organizing. You need to start a conversation within your department, but first ask the question, you might meet with the department chair, uh, what are the different iteration of, of the department promotional antennae, just to take a look at what has changed over time. Um, if you really do want to go deeper, is find out who the chair of your college promotion and tenure committee to talk to them. When you look across the college, what are some similarity and what are some differences? And use that to inform conversation within your own unit. Uh, faculty are the ones that bring about change. The, the resistance you face are likely to come more from your department or division level uh, than because once the negativity builds up, it's very difficult to overcome. Negativity in terms of uh, the privilege and fairness uh, that is not seen as fairness as normal. Uh, and where you look at this distribution of uh, maybe research, I don't know, 60, 70% teaching is there, service is 10%. When service is 10% and it's a part of your promotion and tenure, you can do 50% work and get a part in the back it's not going to factor into how your colleagues deliberate about your work. It's whether or not those metrics are changed and the value that are assigned have changed. So it starts from the groundwork and that conversation has to be there. And on the other point that I'll bring up is that we need to be very mindful, and this speaks to um, what we do with students moving forward. We need to be mindful of how the language we've been accustomed to use it actually defeat some of the work that we are trying to do. Uh, all through our conversation, we always talk about income as a central defining factor of who is high or who is low, whether in terms of the global uh, or the local. Um, in, if uh, Brian Stevenson is right that the opposite of poverty is not wealth, that the opposite of poverty is justice, how do you define the question of high income and low income, because if that is what defines the way of engagement, the, your, your uh, impoverished notion of that conversation is already started as to who is high and who is low. 
And the same thing with global and national, the work that I did at Penn State in collaboration with colleagues in Ibadan, it was clear to me that what I was trying to do for me is global, but the folks in Ibadan, it was national. So some of the work that we are engaging with called global, we just assume that everybody should come on board because you are in South Africa, or you are in Nigeria, you are in Zambia. So when you participate, it's global. No, for you, it may be national. And how do you understand the already uh, difference in language that uh, allow us to uh, uh, at least point out the different lenses through which we understand the common work that we are engaging. So the work you do always starts with the local, whether it's on the ground and where you participate or at the university level, but changes have happened and can happen, but it's not going to happen overnight. You simply need to understand the process that uh, that that uh, that is involved. Thank you very much. And Jimmy, I, I, I instead I would want you to react to a different thing. So you look at the recommendations as written, uh, and since we started this uh, discussions, we are very mindful of equity. Uh, we don't want to perpetuate the inequities that we face. And in, in so, saying so, I'm talking about the global north and south, high income and then low income countries. So do you think the recommendations as, as now would be applicable to low middle income countries or do, do you suggest some changes? Right, thank you, Elijah. I think that's a really uh, important question. Um, the, I think when I look at the statement as it reads at the moment, it's, it's really a good statement overall, I, and I'm very happy with it. But I think there is a, there is a bit of a risk that it, it, it would perpetuate the stereotype that global health research is about people from high income countries with knowledge and expertise helping poor, unfortunate folks in the global south. And for me, global health is, is more than, you know, it's, it's not that. It's about addressing inequities wherever they occur. So I don't think, yeah, I mean, maybe that is something that requires a little bit more attention in the statement, because I, I do think that huge inequities exist between institutions uh, with, you know, whether they be in the global north, within the global north and within the global south. So, for example, uh, I think Catherine has already alluded to this, that in South Africa, we have something called the historically disadvantaged universities and those that have been more privileged because of the system of apartheid that we had. And I think in the US, uh, you know, you have your Ivy League institutions, you have your HBCUs. In, in the UK, you have the Russell Group institutions and, and the rest. So there are huge discrepancies and inequities between those institutions. So I, I, I personally would like to uh, think that there is a, a case to be made for the recommendations contained in this statement to, to be applied more universally, um, because I think they are relevant everywhere. Uh, Perhaps a, another point to be made is on the issue of authorship uh, from, host, from people from host institutions. Um, you know, there is a statement that it should be expected that they be first and last authors, and I think that's great. But I also think that in that there is a risk of tokenism. So I, I think that um, I'd like to see something about in fact, supporting people to play the roles expected of, 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 of those key authorship positions. Um, just to conclude, Elijah, I, I, I have touched on this very briefly, but you know, this the statement focuses at the moment on promotions and, and administrative processes. And I think it's it's quite silent on something which which happens quite commonly in many institutions, which is annual performance reviews. And I think that equity related activities could be included in such HR processes, and they occur a lot more frequently than, as you know, the promotion process. So I think those are some of the things that come to mind. Thank you very much, Jimmy, and uh, to all the panelists. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. And, but this has been a very interesting session. Uh, you have given us the tools to use. 
and you have also shared with us that institutions can change and there are some areas that we have to focus and i think you have also given us um, a knowledge and appreciation that we shouldn't give up and even for some who uh, fear that oh they are vulnerable and their promotions uh, would be at stake uh, that shouldn't be uh, entertained because we can change the system and jimmy you ended us very well on the statement that uh, this should be global and equitable and the language and everything should take into consideration and last but not the least uh, maybe we shouldn't just look at promotion alone but the annual reviews because that is actually the process what whether you are getting there so that if we're doing global work are you ready for promotion you get to know before uh, time so i have really enjoyed the time with the three of you and i wish we could have continued this but um, we probably could keep in touch and send uh, more recommendations to Bethany's group to make this document that what we want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bethany, over to you. Thank you, Professor Pencil, and, and to the panelists and um, folks will have time to continue interacting with them in the next um, session. So we wanted to have some time as a group to talk about um, how do we move forward on this issue. And I think there's a lot of things that can be talked about here. And we're gonna do this in smaller groups for two reasons. One is we wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to, um, excuse me, for some reason my slides close, I'll just do it on the fly. Um, we wanted to make sure that everyone has a chance to elevate some of the points that they wanted to make, but maybe haven't had a chance to make either in the chat or in their questions. Um, the second reason is because we do think that it's really important that we form a broader community of advocates on this issue. And so we hope that through some smaller group discussions that you can have a chance to meet some other colleagues on the call that maybe you haven't met before and elevate some of the points that, that haven't been brought forth yet. Um, so we're going to go into groups of four to five people. We're going to give you about 20 minutes in each group to talk about really anything you want related to this topic, anything that you came to this presentation with or that you were um, was sparked by the presentation. I have some prompts that will be in the slides that we'll share with you. These are totally optional, um, but um, some prompts that you might want to reflect on. I don't expect anyone would answer all three questions um, in this. Probably the most important thing that we ask from you is that you focus on one key take home message to this group. So if there's one thing that you want all of us to hear or specifically for CUGH leadership to hear on this topic, if you can culminate your 20 minute discussion on those points. Um, so to that end, I'm gonna send you into groups. Let me quickly put in the chat um, this Google slide document. Um, so your group number will correspond to the set of slides that we hope you go to. Um, and again, encourage you to just talk about what you think are the most salient points you hope to make um, when we come back together. So I'm going to stop my screen share so I can see and send you to groups. And we'll check back in with everyone in about 20 minutes. Miriam, I think you have flexibility to join a group. Is that correct? Do I have flexibility to join a group? I don't. Um, I'm going to put you in group two, just they have a few people there. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, that's fine. I can't see that I do so.
Wendy, are you still there? Hey, I'm here. I dropped out awesome. 15 minutes to bike to campus, but. No problem. I'm going to throw you into a room um, that just has a low number of participants. Sure thing. Eve, would you, can I put you in a room?
Hey, Wendy. You're muted. I can't hear you. Can you send me back to group seven? I just, I pressed the red button like a three-year-old. <laughs> we actually, I just closed all the rooms. So everybody, oh, okay. 20 seconds. So, um, thank you for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's a really important conversation. It feels like just scratching the surface though. So hopefully. Yeah, because it's so multidimensional, you know, you can't, it's impossible to take this topic and just focus on, you know, promotion and credit or just focus, you know, it's just, uh, it's so multidimensional. Welcome back everybody. Um, I could tell that as I watch people start to put ideas to the slides that you were just getting deep into the conversation. So again, I see this as the start of a long conversation and really tackling this issue, um, definitely not the end. I know that we don't have time for full group report backs from everyone, but was hoping that we could have um, two to four groups volunteer to offer what they thought was the most important take home message. Um, and if you don't feel like your group has the chance now to offer their ideas, note that we're going to be consolidating the notes across the slides, all the ideas that came in the chat, and we will be doing follow up emails with everyone to get more feedback um, and also gauging how you want to be engaged moving forward. Um, but we'd love to get some of the ideas raised um, to the broader group. So can I get some hand raises of folks who are willing to represent um, a salient point that came out of their, their conversation? I see Megan's hand up um, and encourage other people to just throw their hands up for their groups. Megan, please go ahead. So um, one, uh, one major point that came out of our discussion was the idea that when we're thinking about metrics for promotion, um, so those of us you know, involved in, in uh, trying to get people promoted, there's a most universities will produce a list, uh, say here, here's what we consider important, and here are the metrics around how we judge them. And so if you write a letter uh, you know, for a promotion, you got to hit on these topics. So there are things like, you know, the, the, the describe the reputation of this uh, candidate that that specifically means um, their publications, their the number of presentations and the place they've given the presentations, their editorships, uh, their um, role on um, on academic societies, et cetera. So I, I really think that um, what we need to do is add metrics that are very concrete in exactly the same way around um, health equity and, and research equity. And to do that, we actually have to think very carefully about how, how one measures one's contribution to, to equitable research. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot of room for discussion around that, but it can't just be somebody saying, oh yeah, I think they're great people doing equitable research. We need to actually come up with how, how did we know that they're doing equitable research? And then we need to communicate that to early career um, academics in time for them to actually recognize that this is this is something they should be working on and not say, oh, surprise, you know, we, all this time we've been telling you just do your own thing, you know, ignore everybody else, but now we've changed the rules. If we tell people at the beginning that this is what they're being evaluated on, they will respond. And I, I as I said before in the, in the chat, I do think that going after journal um, editors is another um, way to um, achieve some of this because people are very responsive to to authorship. Thanks, Megan. Um, I see the next hand up is Capri uh, Rana. Yes, hello, thank you. I was in group number two and um, uh, one of the significant points that was brought up by two of our team members um, who happened to be individuals at um, African institutions they um, indicated there was a rigid promotion criteria for some institutions of weighting authorship in scholarly publishing. So an article of, of the weight for co-authors um, was different from the main author. And the contribution of um, 
all of the authors are not always acknowledged. And this is a, this, this is a problematic area when it comes to promotion process. Um, and it's, it's significant to a value um, skills such as data collection and other skills, because the idea is that pub, uh, authorship and um, con contribution to papers does not only uh, begin with the writing of it. And that's what um, one of our colleagues wanted to express, I believe. If I have said that incorrectly, I do hope they'll correct me. Another one was um, universities, when we have letters of reference for promotion or tenure, um, one or the other, because some of our professionals um, is such as uh, in my case, I'm primary faculty. So we have promotion, but we do not have tenure. So um, in, the, in these cases, um, we want our institutions to accept letters from those in the global south to accept letters from the global north and vice versa um, because of the value of these collaborations. So uh, I think that's all that we were able to really talk about. We had a lot um, to discuss. So I'll just uh, end it there. And I hope if I've made any errors, if anyone um, will just uh, make sure I got it right. Thank you for raising those points. And I'm gonna um, call on Susan Scooty uh, to offer some last thoughts here. Hi, uh, our group uh, felt that NIH needed to change its policy around indirect rates. And in the absence of uh, NIH uh, more fairly rewarding LMIC institutions, that maybe the high income institution can give a certain proportion to the low or middle income country institution. Um, uh, we had similar thoughts about promotional letters from the Global South. And uh, the other thought that our group talked about was um, uh, grants may involve, uh, going forward, uh, maybe grants from NIH or Fogarty should involve uh, uh, pairing uh, the low and middle income country institution with a uh, lesser known low and middle income country institution in the region, um, which was also talked about in the general uh, session. If I got anything wrong, <laughs> please correct me. Thank you. Thank you all for representing some of those conversations. And again, we recognize that there were many more conversations. So if you can get your ideas into those slides, or as I said, we will follow up um, by email to collect some of your individual or group ideas. Um, I do wanna just be conscious of everyone's time. I think we could spend days and days on this um, and, and work on this over the scope of hopefully um, not too many years, hopefully we see changes before that, but over much more time than today. Um, but before I hand it off to um, Dr. Lickfield for some final closing thoughts, I just wanted to note that we had um, a lot of colleagues joining from around the world and appreciate everyone's both commitment to this issue and views on this. Um, when we set up this session, we had two goals. Um, the first was just to form a community around this topic and recognize that a lot of us feel really invested in making changes at our own institutions and trying to find advocates and allies that we could align with to move this forward. Um, the second was to get specific ideas to um, put in these recommendations and strategies to move these recommendations forward. So I want to thank all of our speakers who offered their insights on but what needs to change and how we make those changes. Um, hopefully this provides some good fodder to um, both our institutions, but specifically we were speaking to um, CEGH and, and hoping that they could take from this some ideas to move this forward as a consortium. So with that, um, I want to offer the, the Zoom platform to um, Professor Lickfield, who um, is going to offer some thoughts both from her vantage as a global health researcher but also as the chair of the CUGH board. I just want to offer my personal thanks to everyone for being here and Dr. Villickfield over to you. Thank you and uh, Bethany let me begin with congratulating you on a tremendously rich um, session. I, uh, I while I wasn't on all the time, I had colleagues on, so I had a blow-by-blow -blow, um, feedback from the rich discussion that happened. 
And I, I come to you actually in somewhat of a unique position as being from an LMIC doing a research in an LMIC and as Dean sitting in an institution, that's it's one that's very traditional as many of us are, um, whether you're at Pitt or at Stanford or other in a high income country. So um, my advice and recommendations and opportunities for CUGH to move forward and each one of us are as follows. One is that it is really important to, I, to characterize um, the, the, the influencers. And so there are internal forces of change and there are external forces of change. So let's begin with the external forces of change. Um, COVID certainly has shown, and as the informing said, um, institutions can change. The, the pandemic has shown that we are now, um, Zoom has been part, is now part of our life and will never go away. Who would have thought that? And so institutions, academic institutions can change. Um, externally, funders can also change. And so you've heard from our group from Susan um, that um, we could, um, we should have continued to have those conversations. And I really have to acknowledge um, Michelle Berry for leading that conversation about indirect rates. Uh, indirect rates to lower and middle income countries. If we are true about whether we call it capacity building or capacity exchange, if we are true about the bi-directional value of that, if that's the culture change we're after, then we need to reciprocally award a lower and middle income country to be able to do that. You can't expect increase in capacity um, with a lower, amount of funds to make that happen. Um, on the internal side, in a way we've seen the enemy and the enemy is us. Um, we sit, I, I no longer, but we have we sat on promotion and tenure committees. We looked at who was first and who was last author. We were um, providing value on where a letter, one of those 12 letters came from. And so that's that's internal, that's us. We can change that. We can um, fully accept and value a letter coming from a lower and middle income country or from a, or from a colleague from a lesser known institutions in higher and income countries. We, we could fully accept that. But many of us either have or sat on promotion and tenure committees and we maybe knocked our nose on that. Um, we can um, fully integrate, we the faculty can fully integrate um, equity as a required component of every single course, and we have that here, or as a required component, not only at the annual performance review, but at a quarterly or six month performance review. And so we can do that. It's not about checking the box, right? So how do we internally bring those forces of change together to get to that change. Um, the second um, area that where we have room um, to grow is in however we call it, um, is capacity building or capacity exchange. Increasingly, and I really am, am not bashful to um, publicize that plenary number five, of our conference on the 15th, will take a new look at what global health is, what global health now means, um, and what the characteristics are. So when, when is something a global health issue? I couldn't agree more again with the informant when he said, well, obesity is a global health issue, doesn't matter where it, where it happens. Um, so we're not geographically bound by, by global health. But if we, if we look at that, then, um, more and more, we are learning from our colleagues in lower and middle income countries. And so at, at a minimum, capacity building is, bi is bidirectionally beneficial. We don't necessarily know it all in higher income countries. Um, and then um, the third issue is that we cannot, and that has a, has a component of external and internal fund, internal forces of change. We cannot be um, strong-armed 
by having only funding determine our commitment to capacity exchange, capacity building in lower and middle income countries. So when the NIH funding dries up, um, we should continue to be committed internally from where we from where we're from. And then the last thing I would say is we need to start much earlier than we're currently starting in terms of growing the research expertise and valuing the research expertise everywhere. Um, and that includes roving residencies. It includes um, working with high schools. Uh, it includes um, pre-doctoral being much earlier and valuing the pre-doctoral work um, as much as we follow, we value the postdoctoral work. And the very, very last thing, Bethany, I will say is I have been, and I have been on the receiving, I've been either on those committees or been on the receiving and of those committees, those external review committees that NIH brings together. Um, and it is us that doesn't value. Um, this kind of reciprocal benefit. And so the change has to come from us as it has to come from institutions, both external and internal to us. Um, and I hope that this is a discussion that we will continue. And uh, I'm so tremendously uh, thankful um, of uh, members, active members like this of CUGH. And I'm very humbled to lead this organization for this period of time and move this along and, and um, take action as Michelle has always uh, pushed us to do <laughs> and, 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 and Bethany rather than only talking. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you all for being here and look for future emails from, from us to push this forward. Wish everyone a good day. <laughs>